A debate adjustment, more on the Biden reports, and finally, well, some extra spite at the end. All that's coming up right now on I'm Right. Well, we have an adjustment for the debate. And I'm going to read you this quote about the adjustment. And then you and I, we need to have a little talk. Quote, in order to enforce this agreed upon rule, they're muting the microphones. I should probably clarify. Muting the microphones. One guy's talking, the other one's muted. In order to enforce this agreed upon rule, the only candidate whose microphone will be open during these two minute periods is the candidate who has the floor under the rules. We realize, after discussions with both campaigns, that neither campaign may be totally satisfied with the measures announced today. One may think they go too far, and one may think they do not go far enough. We are comfortable that these actions strike the right balance and that they are in the interest of the American people for whom these debates are held. Okay, let's clarify something briefly here. One may think they go too far, and one may think they do not go far enough. Here's what happened post-debate. That one sentence right there tells you everything you need to know. After the last debate, when Donald Trump stomped all over Biden and then stomped all over the moderator and didn't slow down all night long and hammered the gas pedal and just talk, 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 no matter who was talking all night, the Biden campaign freaked out. They didn't like it. They put in a formal complaint, and I do mean formal complaint, that they want Donald Trump's microphone muted the next debate. Donald Trump's campaign freaked out and said, no, 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 you can't be muting me ever. You can't mute me ever. And Biden's campaign came right back. Nope, whenever Joe is speaking, Trump has to be muted. And how does all this end after all this arguing? Donald Trump's going to get muted. I mean, Biden, too. And Biden was interrupting the whole time last time, too. Don't let anybody fool you on that. But it ends up with Donald Trump being muted while Joe Biden speaks. And it it occurred to me as I read this, as I looked over this whole thing, we always lose. The GOP always loses. And don't argue with me on that. I understand. Well, we have the presidency, buddy. Government has only grown for a century, a century of increased government. They're the big government party. We're supposed to be the small government party, and it's only ever increased. Sometimes a little at a time, sometimes a lot at a time, only ever increased. Spending only increases, always. In fact, even a slight cut to spending, to spending increases, is, is, is act, the people act like it's a huge cut to what was already spent. Democrats win all the time. They win every time. And we never, ever, ever win these battles. And I was trying to wrap my mind around why. How does that happen? How does it happen? You know what's a great example of this? This is a perfect example. Climate change. Climate change is a great example. You see, the Earth's climate changes. That's how God made the world. The earth has climate patterns, always has, always will. Periods that are warmer, periods that are cooler. That's the way the earth works. And yet, Democrats a long time ago started hammering on this notion that man-made carbon dioxide is is changing the climate of the world. Only it starts small and then they get steam with it and steam with it and steam with it and soon they're getting the courts to certify it then they're getting teachers to teach it and now what do we have today look around you what do we have today 90 percent of the american population on either side everybody combined believes that man-made carbon dioxide is changing the climate of the world we have study after study after study right here in front of me that completely disproves this a total myth And yet 90% of this country, of the world really, believes that to be a fact. Why is that? Because leftists never stop moving forward. It's so aggressive. It's such an aggressive ideology. They're always advancing. And Republicans, they always lose because they're completely uncomfortable with any kind of advancement at all. 
In fact, they consider minor losses to be wins. Look around you. You can see right now, look, it's, it's campaign season, right? It's not just president, it's congressmen, it's, it's senators. You'll, you'll see all these local state senator things and oh, some of these state senator ads, but that's another thing entirely. You'll see, I can count, I'm in Texas and I can count on maybe one hand, I probably need two hands to count the Republican ads I've seen talking about, we can reduce emissions, we can reduce carbon emissions. That's where we are now. That's where we are. We've given so much ground that now we play their game. Well, I, I'll, I'll reduce emissions too. I, it's just it's just that I'll reduce them a little cheaper. We play the left's game on the left's field with the left's referees enforcing the left's rules, and we wonder why we lose every single time. And that's why we treat close losses like wins. Whoo! Oh, man! They barely got us that time, which is a moral victory. Good job, fellas. Maybe we'll win next time. Probably not. But if we keep it close again, that's a win. That's how we handle every single thing. Why do we lose the presidential debates? Presidential debates are a gigantic deal. Many of the undecided voters, they've shown it time and time again. They tune in these presidential debates to try to make their decisions. Voters since the televised era, JFK, Nixon, have been turning on. They watch, they turn on the TV, and they decide who they want to be president of the United States of America. They're they're a big deal. How are we still debating the moderator every single debate? Democrats have never once had to debate the moderator. The GOP has had to do it so much, they just expect it. They changed the rules right before the debates on their behalf. Have you ever once seen them change the rules on behalf of a Republican one time ever in the history of these debates? No, you haven't, because it's never happened. We have got to completely change, not this next election. We have got to change our mentality. And I mean, it has to go 180 degrees and race the other direction. We are never ever going to save this country from the leftist hordes like this. I am so sick of watching the GOP bow and whimper and lose every time. Our three moderators, even in the tough Trump era, our three moderators, one was Chris Wallace. I don't think I have to elaborate for you on what he thinks about Trump and exactly how that turned out. The next one had to get kicked off the debate because not only did he intern for Joe Biden at one point in time, he got caught trying to coordinate with another anti-Trump guy, Scarmucci. The idiot just put it out on public Twitter. And then the third debate, they're changing the rules three days before the debate to make sure it's easier for Joe Biden. And we're still playing this game. How are we this weak and feckless and stupid? Elections are a big deal. Presidential elections are a big deal. And we're still stuck with with this crap. We have got to change mentalities. However this election goes. You know I think Donald Trump's going to win. I want Donald Trump to win. He better win. But this stuff, I know you're thinking, well, it's just a muted microphone. And it is. But it's just yet another thing that we didn't win on. Ah, And of course the left... They're brilliant. You saw the statement they put out. Well, look, I mean, Trump's not happy and Biden's not happy, but everything's fine. In their mind, allowing the GOP a tiny concession when they hand Democrats yet another huge one is, wow, I mean, look, you should both be happy. We do this time and time again. When are we going to stop? And maybe it's time to ask, do we want to stop? Do we want to win? Or do we want to be the noble loser? I want you to think about that the next time your local congressman, your local senator runs an ad and you see it. And he's talking about, we will reduce emissions. Playing the left's game on the left's field with the left's referees enforcing the left's rules. And then look around and wonder every time, why don't we ever win? You don't win that way. Trump's going after the press. Remember the tears from the totally non-biased anchors? We have another one of them coming up next week, you know. Kristen Welker, 
She deleted her entire account. I wonder why. I can't imagine. You know, I've known her for a long time. She's extraordinarily unfair, but that's all right. She's hosting the debate. Her timeline, her social media timeline, was so anti-Republican, anti-Trump, so slanted the other way, she just flat wiped her account. She didn't go through and, well, I should probably dump that tweet. Ooh, better dump that one, too. She just hit delete. Better just clean the whole thing out. But you know what? That's not on Kristen Welker. We agreed to that. How do we agree to that? We have these three debate moderators. It would be like it would be like the Democrats agreeing to three presidential debates with me, Tucker Carlson, and Sean Hannity, and Buck Sexton, and Bill O'Reilly, and Dana Lash, and uh, uh, who's another? Rush Limbaugh, and and all these guys—a gigantic slate of them. It would be like us moderating every Democrat debate ever. That's what it would be. They would never do it, and they'd be crazy to do it. And we do it every time, and nobody bats an eye. We'll complain a little. Oh, this is unfair. And then we go out there and do it again. <laughs> but, you know, I, maybe I waste my breath too much telling these people to stand up and change. Trump is out there right now, and he's savaging Dr. Fauci. And you know exactly how I feel about Dr. Fauci. Not exactly high marks. I think we treated the entire country, 330 million people, $20 trillion economy, like it's a tiny village with 50 people in it. Oh, just go home and lock down. Uh, oh, stand six feet apart. That'll be sick. What, what idiocy is that? What child came up with that stuff? But Trump's savaging him right there now. What? Listen, this is what he's saying. People are tired of COVID. I have the biggest rallies I've ever had, and we have COVID. People are saying whatever. Just leave us alone. They're tired of it. People are tired of hearing Fauci and all these idiots. These people, these people that have gotten it wrong. Fauci's a nice guy. He's been here for 500 years. He's a disaster. I mean, this guy's, if I listen to him, we have 500,000 deaths. Now, I won't disagree about Fauci being a disaster, but let's be honest about something. I didn't put Dr. Fauci in front of a camera at the beginning of coronavirus. You didn't put Dr. Fauci in front of a camera at the beginning of coronavirus. The first time I heard him speak, wear a mask, go home, shelter in place, everybody hide. I knew what I was dealing with. It's your guy. Joe Biden is, of course, now defending Fauci. Quote, Coronavirus inspections are spiking across the country, but President Trump decided to attack Dr. Fauci again today as a disaster and call public health experts idiots <laughs> instead of laying out a plan to beat this virus or heeding their advice about how we can save lives and get our economy moving again. President Trump even criticized me yesterday for listening to the scientists. That's not an attack. That's a badge of honor. Gosh, Joe Biden sucks so bad. It's really going to suck if that guy wins. I'll tell you that much. All right. I know that wasn't exactly bright and sunny. I had to get it off my chest, and this is where I come to do so. All that may have made you uncomfortable, but I'm right. You know what else is going to make you uncomfortable? The fact that our deficit this year alone, this year alone, is over $3 trillion. Do you remember how we used to scream and have these wild tea parties about $1 trillion deficits? Pfft, we blew through that like it was nothing this year alone. And that's while we carpet bomb 50% of our tax base by small businesses shuttering, entertainment industry shuttering, airline industry shuttering. You better get a gold IRA. Go get a gold IRA from Gold Alliance. I'm not telling you to do something nuts. Just make that part of your portfolio so you can make sure you're a bit more protected. You know why. Go to goldalliance.com slash jesse. That's goldalliance.com slash jesse. We'll be back. Is freedom of the press a bad idea? 
No, don't throw anything at the TV. I don't want a state-run media. Obviously, that's pretty much the worst thing in the history of the world. But our press is terrible. And they're terrible because they're allowed to be. And what's, this is what's amazing about the American media. They're so leftist. They're so in the tank for Democrats that now they don't realize they're leftists anymore. For them, that's not being a leftist. It's just being reality. It is beyond belief how damaging these Hunter emails are for Joe Biden and Joe Biden's presidential campaign if you had any semblance of a media in the United States of America. But we don't. And they just won't cover it. They won't talk about it. He won't campaign, as we just talked about. He, he's going into hiding until Thursday at the debate. He's going into hiding until Thursday and not answering questions about it. And Trump, understandably, is losing his freaking mind. The campaign strategy seems to be to call Biden a criminal. Why is that? He is a criminal. He's a criminal. He got caught. Read his laptop. And you know who's a criminal? You're a criminal for not reporting it. You are a criminal for not reporting it. Let me tell you something. Joe Biden is a criminal, and he's been a criminal for a long time. And you're a criminal in the media for not reporting it. Good luck, everybody. Have a good time. Have a good time. I'm going to miss Trump when he's gone. They hate him. And you know what? They should hate him. And this is not this is not nice to say. But it is the reality of life. If you're a Republican, a Republican politician, or you're thinking about running for office, maybe you're currently running for office, I need you to hear me here, and this is a fact. If the media doesn't hate you, you're doing something really, really wrong. And I don't mean if they just kind of dislike you. You're still doing something wrong. They have to hate your guts or you're doing something wrong. Make sure they do. And look, obviously the reporter's not a criminal, but it is freaking criminal. How do you look at that? The Democratic nominee for president of the United States of America, and he's up in the pools. He's up in all the pools, and they still won't cover it. Even Mike Pence is talking about it. Well, we, we just, uh, you know, we just stand for the principle the American people have a right to know what's going on here. The director of national intelligence today, I know, made it clear that uh, there is no evidence to suggest that the information on that computer reported in the New York Post is a, is a result of any disinformation campaign. Uh, and the American people have a right uh, to know about uh, the business dealings of the Biden family. I mean, I mean, Lou, we just spent the last three and a half years uh, where uh, the Democrat uh, nominee in 2016 uh, had had worked with a foreign entity to try and dig up dirt on President Trump. And I, I don't remember uh, the media shutting off access to that information. Right. That, uh, let's still wrap our minds around this. Not only will they not press him on it, no, I mean, shoot, you can't find him. You'd have to go to his basement to press him on it. Not only will they not press him on it, they're actively suppressing the information. And again, I'll go back to the Republican Party that I savaged at the beginning of this show. Do you know what the Senate just announced? They're delaying the subpoenas they had threatened for Facebook and Twitter. You remember when, all, when they were censoring this story? And every Tom, Dick, and Harry senator for the GOP, get ready. There's a subpoena coming. The law, we won't stand for this. Three days later, uh, maybe, maybe another time. Maybe another time. But we don't, well, look, we don't want to look mean. That's what we have defending us. Maybe it's time for a third party. Do I seem fired up tonight? I'm fired up tonight. House Oversight Committee, James Comer had this to say. I can promise you as chairman of the House Oversight Committee, we will issue subpoenas and we'll get to the bottom of this. In worst case scenario, Pelosi stays speaker and the Republicans remain in the minority. Uh, we're not gonna let up on this because if this were a situation with a regular rank and file congressman, they would be before the ethics committee and they would be held accountable. We cannot let the president of the United States have a potential liability like this and we can't let future presidents 
that have uh, below below average in achievement sons like Hunter Biden be able to profit greatly just because of their last name. So this is something that's important for the Republicans on the Oversight Committee, and this is something the American people uh, expect to be held accountable, and we're going to hold the Bidens accountable if, in fact, there was wrongdoing. Oh, they won't. With all due respect to James Comer, I, don't, I have no problem with the man. I would, you know I would tell you if I did. Don't know the man at all. No, they won't. They won't hold him accountable. Stop talking to me about subpoenas. I've been hearing subpoenas about everything underneath the sun for four years. Not a single person who committed all these horrible acts under the Democratic Party has gone to jail. Not one person. They've hardly lost their jobs. Mark Meadows is upset. Let me just say, it's not a surprise to me that uh, here we are, the very first of the week, and that Joe Biden is putting a lid on everything because he's been putting a lid on what he means by court packing or whether he's for it or against it. And But he's also not wanting to answer the critical questions, what he knew about Hunter Biden's uh, corrupt, uh, alleged corrupt activities, what he knew about the interference. You know, I, I find it fascinating that some of the monies uh, that appear to be flowing to the Biden family family broadly uh, come from Romania, from Ukraine, and from China. Yeah. The very three countries that Joe Biden was a uh, special envoy to. I mean, that is true. But hey, the media is all over it. All right. I know these are stressful times. I know you lay down at night and you think to yourself, oh no, stressful times, we got an election coming up, plus life. I mean, isn't life still there? Wife, husband, kids, job, what did, everything's still happening. It's easy to lay there and have those racing thoughts keep you awake at night. That's why you need an ebb sleep. It's not pills, you're not putting chemicals in your body. It applies cooling to your forehead, calming those thoughts down, putting you asleep faster and keeping you asleep. Go get one. Trust me, it is life-changing. Go to tryeb.com slash jesse. That's tryebb.com slash jesse. Use the promo code jesse. 25 bucks off. We'll be back. Joining me now, as she has before, TP USA. That's Turning Point USA spokesperson Isabel Brown. Isabel, why do Republicans always lose at everything? I, even when we own no, the presidency. That's the narrative. Yeah. <laughs> it, well, I mean, even, look, we have the presidency right now. It's done a great job. We have the Senate. We're ramming through all these judges. Life should be fine. We can't even get these people to stop changing the rules of the debate to be more anti-Trump. We never reset the narrative. Obviously, you're a Gen Z activist, as it is listed for you. From a younger person's point of view, do you see what I'm seeing? Or are you not cynical enough yet? You know, the cynicism still is there, and I often interact with multi-generational conservatives, so I definitely interact with that on a day-to-day -day basis. But Gen Z could not be more excited about this president. We continue to look for an outside perspective in Washington and new ideas that are going to solve these problems that have really plagued our entire experience growing up in the United States. You know, most people don't know what Gen Z is. So just to clear that up, in case it's a little bit confusing, millennials and Gen Z could not be more different from one another. And it's a very exciting thing to be a part of. Gen Z Americans are born in 1997 or later and have been proven by several national polls and surveys to be the most conservative generation our country has seen since World War II. Why? I've heard this before. And look, I've run into so many people roughly your age. I'm not going to guess that because I'm not going to get murdered today. And I'm telling you, <laughs> they are the most blood red conservatives. They're the, the only people I've ever met who are as blood red as I am. Why? Where did that come from? I'm 23 and I definitely won't be offended by you asking by any means. We are so excited to be part of a new resurgence of what it means to call ourselves Americans, to return to our roots of freedom, of liberty, of individual responsibility over our lives. And I think we have this culture in our generation because we saw everything that was happening with millennials a few years before us. You know, the massive protests now that have graduated from college campuses into burning things in the street because they can't handle any sort of ideological diversity. And we thought, we want nothing to do with that. We want to live in the America that our parents and grandparents have told us about. And we're doing everything we can to win the culture war and get us back to those roots. 
Can you all see clearly the way so many people can't can't that the left has won the culture war and it's it's necessary for us to take it back? I, I mean, people, it's it's common on the right. I see this all the time with my friends of they'll yell about TV and they'll yell about movies and music and sports and everything else now. But they don't feel the need to get involved in there and change it. They just kind of want to wash their hands of it. That stuff does set the culture. I'm sure you can see it. It absolutely does. And the left has been very effective in decades before right now in 2020 in reaching young Americans where they're at, not just with fancy prescripted political debates, which I know we want to talk a little bit about today, but everywhere in culture, on our college campuses, in music, in movies, in how we interact with each other on social media. And so we're playing a bit of a catch up game now from a conservative perspective, reaching people where they're at on Instagram, on Twitter, even on TikTok, the new up and coming platform that most Gen Z Americans are communicating with each other through. And we're doing a great job of that because all of a sudden it's something new, it's exciting, and young Americans are really hungry for something different culturally. College campuses. Everybody knows about college campuses. They are much dumped on mainly by me and some others as being just a hotbed of communism anymore. And the last time I really interacted heavily with college Republicans, I was running for office and it was less than impressive as far as the, the conservative representation on, on campus. Is that changing? I know TPUSA is all over this and I'm glad they are. Is that changing or is it still pretty much crappy? It has dramatically changed. And I started college as a freshman in 2015. So just before our last very controversial presidential election. And when I started college, no young conservative would be caught dead admitting that they voted for Donald Trump wearing a MAGA hat on campus or even sporting one of our turning point socialism sucks buttons on their backpacks. It would be social suicide and frankly would even result in the loss of one's safety on their college campus. Now what's happening with Gen Z entering the college arena and even beyond college graduating into the American workforce, we're seeing this resurgence of passion of what it means to be a proud conservative in the United States. You're seeing people wanting to have political discussions and ideological discussions in their college classroom, in their dorm, in student government. None of that happened even just a few years ago. And culturally, I think that's very attributed to groups like Turning Point USA, attacking this from a cultural perspective and not just from a political one. What are we expecting Thursday? I, I, obviously, I'm unhappy about the debate change in rules, which is clearly an attack against President Trump. But Thursday, a lot of people loved what Donald Trump did last time. I personally liked it a lot. A lot of people did not like it. I just find his style of talking over everybody to be intentional and well done, well branded. But some people didn't like it. What do you expect to see out of him? What do you want to see out of him? Well, I'm very eager to see a president be willing to fight back against the narrative and frankly, the lies of the left. Throughout my entire lifetime, conservatives were very much expected to be polite, to wait our turn, to not say anything that might possibly offend someone. And culturally, that made such a profound impact, especially on young Americans and letting the left win when it came to that culture war piece that we talk about all the time with Turning Point USA and especially with Gen Z conservatism. On Thursday, I won't be surprised if there's more of a tendency for a moderator to ask friendly questions to Joe Biden uh, than President Donald Trump. I think we've seen that several times in a terms of a debate situation throughout this campaign season. But I'm expecting that the president won't let the former vice president get away with not answering for some of these very extreme accusations that have come out in the last few weeks. You know, nobody's asking former Vice President Joe Biden about all of these emails we're seeing him copied on with his son, Hunter Biden. No one's asking him about allegedly taking a payment from the Chinese Communist Party with a deal with an energy company in China. And I'm anticipating the moderator won't ask many of those questions on Thursday, but I doubt President Trump will let that go unsaid. Joe Biden, do we really expect Joe Biden to be president for four years? I, I don't I don't understand how this isn't a bigger story. He called it a lid Monday morning on campaigning. He's not going to emerge from the shadows again until Thursday night. In what world do people think this man's going to be able to physically perform the function of president of the United States? You hit the nail right on the head. We are 15 days out from Election Day. This is hit the rubber to the road time when it comes to interacting with constituents and getting your message out there as much as humanly possible. You're seeing people on Team Trump travel to three or four states even in one day. The president 
holding rallies in three states in 24 hours because he's so excited about getting the messaging out there and communicating with possible voters. Meanwhile, former Vice President Joe Biden calls a lid for four days with his press corps, not even willing to communicate the platform that he's running on here in the next few days. I think it's been very clear from the beginning that it's much more important who is on the vice presidential slot for the ticket on the left side of the aisle rather than who's running for president. There's been several situations, even in live media interviews, where former Vice President Joe Biden and Senator Kamala Harris have admitted to the very important reality that the vice president on this ticket may take the presidency very quickly into winning election. Uh, and it's really their opinions that matter most right now when it comes to the campaign. Do people like Kamala Harris? I mean, and, I mean, normal people. Look, I can't stand her. But do normal people like Kamala Harris? You know, I don't see a lot of likability, even from the left side of the aisle when it comes to Senator Kamala Harris. I think she comes across very brazen and unwilling to communicate with people who disagree with her. We saw a lot of that with the vice presidential debate. Uh, very sassy and upset when the vice president tried to push back a little bit against some of that narrative she was trying to share during the debate, and it just didn't come across as genuine or authentic to American voters. I don't see a lot of likability, and I don't think that will help them here in the next 15 days. She did kind of do that kind of head side thing, and nobody, nobody enjoys that. Nobody does. Absolutely. Isabel Brown, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. All right. You need to know something. Home title theft sucks. And I know that's not exactly breaking news, but here's why it sucks. It's one thing to have somebody stick a gun in your face and take your wallet on a sidewalk somewhere. That's obviously not a pleasant experience, but at least you know, right? You know, okay, well, the wallet's gone. Got to cancel the credit cards. Not ideal. I lost the 20 I had in there. Home title theft sucks because you don't know. And you don't know until it's too late. And when I say too late, in general, people find out and then they have to either A, spend tens of thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars on an attorney to make the thing go away, or B, it's too, too late and you get evicted from your home. So you have to stop it before they get to it. And there's only one way to do that, and that's Home Title Lock. Go to HomeTitleLock.com. That's HomeTitleLock.com and sign up. And look, I'm giving you some free stuff. When you use the code RADIO, that actually gets you 30 days for free. HomeTitleLock.com, promo code RADIO. Go today. We'll be back. Joining me now is a friend of mine, Stephen Cruiser. He's a senior columnist and associate editor for PJ Media and a stand-up comic. And you know what, Stephen? We're going to start right there. Stand-up comedy. I have always admired it a lot more than I think pe most people do. I think it is a very difficult thing to stand up in front of people and make them laugh. How did you even start doing it? Um, I was here at the University of Arizona, young man, and mostly I was enrolled at the University of Arizona a lot, not going to class <laughs> a lot. I was mostly in the library writing jokes with my then comedy partner. A friend of mine from high school asked me to start a comedy team. I said no for six months, and then I said yes just to shut him up. And then we started doing well, then he quit, and I just kept doing it. I dropped out of college, told my mom I'd go on the road for a year, see how that worked, and then it was 30 years later. <laughs> Now, obviously, nobody's going to question the courage of a United States Marine as you are, but it has to be nerve-wracking, doesn't it? I mean, do you still have the heart pounding before you go on stage, or is that all gone now and you're just done caring? It's a different kind of thing. If I'm not nervous before a gig, I'm usually going to bomb. So a little bit in the stomach is fine. That's That keeps me sharp. That's what I like. Um, the terror of going on stage. And the thing is, with most comics who are good, um, it's like one of the only things we know how to do. So yeah, it's tough, but you know, you uh, you realize soon that your options are kind of limited. <laughs> you're just like corporate world, <laughs> yeah, that's not going to happen. Um, so so you just kind of resign yourself to it. And I really feel that's the way with almost every good comic I've ever met. We're just like, yeah, we weren't going to be out there, you know, working for Goldman Sachs. Joe Biden, Donald Trump. I, I am, as everybody knows, a bit of a cynic on where the country is in total. Presidential elections aside, I just, I, I feel like 
uh, what you could call it a cynic or a realist, I feel like we're a late stage empire and I'm okay whatever way the election goes. I obviously want Trump to win. I think it'll be better for the country. If Biden wins, it'll be very revealing of where we are as a country. What say you? Well, I'm a cynic about the election. Most of my friends and colleagues are really enthusiastic and optimistic about it. And I can't tap into that at all. I've tried. God knows I've tried. <laughs> but I'm not feeling it <laughs> at all, Jesse. Um, and Why? it's mostly because I live, well, you're familiar with Tucson. In fact, you, you know, I mean, I live in, I live by the university. I'm in probably the most liberal neighborhood in the most liberal city in Arizona. Oof. Um, Oof. And so I'm surrounded. I'm, I've, I'm surrounded by people who still have Bernie 2016 signs in their, in their yard. Oh. Right now. Seriously. So it, it's, you know, I never encounter anybody, but I think, I, I think right now that we're seeing the culmination of the decades of public education indoctrination and um, the media bias that like, you know, that sells people on the fact that they're going to die from coronavirus tomorrow when they're not. And, you know, some people do die. It's not what everybody said it was going to be. So I think that I, I agree with you on the late stage empire thing. And so, and that's just the only thing that makes me feel better about being older is now like, ah, I don't have to put up with this crap for, for that much longer. <laughs> I, mean, I feel bad for my kid, but um, I was like, that's one of the few things that makes me okay with being older. So yeah, I think, I think we're in a bad place either way with the election. Um, you know, we'll be, we'll be working from the opposition if Biden wins. And that's not always a bad thing in this, in this business or in this gig. I've done it, you know, if, you know, I did it for eight years under Obama and I had plenty of work and everything was just fine. So I'm not that worried about it, but I would prefer that Trump win, obviously, so I don't have to end up in a gulag. Yes, yes, as would I. <laughs> I why can't we ever get decent people in government? I, and I, I really genuinely mean that. And I'm not doing the normal anti-government thing like I always do. Everybody knows I hate government anyway. But when we run into these bureaucrats, and I don't mean low-level idiots, like the director of the FBI... We have had how many that absolutely suck. You can make an argument. J. Edgar Hoover was the best one they ever had. These guys are complete morons. We can't find somebody decent to run the Federal Bureau of Investigation. How is that possible? Are these not, do, they, do they not pay well enough? I think they pay too well, for one. Um, this is something I've written about extensively over the years, is I rail against the bureaucracy a lot. And a bureaucracy, especially the federal bureaucracy in the United States, exists solely to bloat and perpetuate itself. There's no built-in reason for them to be efficient. There's no built-in reason for them to be terribly good at their jobs. It's just they, they got to coast and they need to learn how to coast. And they all learn how to coast. That's how you get all these you know rich people in Virginia now who are working for the federal government. I think we have to, one of the things when Trump first started and there was all this turnover in his administration, I was going, I love this because I don't think any of them should have jobs for very long. Um, I'm like, if they're there for three weeks, that's fine by me. So I think <laughs> we make it too easy to be a career bureaucrat, and that's the problem. And the longer someone is in the bureaucracy, the worse they get at being efficient or anything resembling good at their job. Okay, well, I mean, not to nerd out on the details here, but you're the perfect person to ask. How do we fix it? You obviously can't go to a system where everybody's fired every four years because then you'd never have decent people because there'd be no job security. But we can't have this system where we can't, we can't fire these morons when they screw up big time. What's, what's, what can we do to change it? I think part of it is you have to figure out a way to be able to fire people if they're not doing their jobs well. And that's that's a huge problem in so many areas of life right now where, you know, somebody, you know, like a teacher in a, in a teacher's union right now, they can come in and just be awful human beings and their jobs are protected. Um, there, there is no easy fix. It's not like you can term limit an appointee. <laughs> um, but we have to figure out a way to either pair the salaries I, I think that's part of it right now. The longer you stay, I mean, that's a sweet gig if you get into the bureaucracy like that. Um, that's where all that Northern Virginia money is coming from now. Uh, the, you know, the longer you're there, the more money you get. And we've got to be able to either rein that in or figure out some sort of time limit for each thing. It's a, okay, here's you're serving this. It's like an elected position. You're serving in this capacity for this amount of time. And that's it. And that's all you've got to hope for there, except for lower level support people. Should we break up D.C.? And I don't mean reducing the government. Obviously, you and I are both way on board with that. Was it a mistake to allow 
D.C. to be D.C. and to have everything centralized there because it was just, what, isn't it inevitable it was going to be a magnet for filth? When I read these articles about how every which county or all the counties like you just pointed out in Virginia and Maryland and much surrounding D.C., shouldn't they meet like once every two years like the Texas legislature and just never be there? That would be ideal right now. I don't think the original idea was to have it turn out like this. I think the problem is, especially in the last... I'd say 30 years at least, the states, you know, for you know, for all of our states' rights, you know, uh, uh, birth and everything in this country and, you know, not wanting to have a big centralized government, the states have been ceding their power and their responsibility slowly in a slow bleed to D.C. for the last 30 years especially, um, probably longer than that. And so that's where the problem really started to kick in, where the states are just like, yeah, we don't want to do this anymore. Yeah, we don't want to, you know, we're going to we're gonna let the feds do it. Let the feds take care of education. Let the feds take care of, you know, because the feds weren't taking care of education until the 70s, um, late 70s, I believe, actually. So it's, I think that's the big problem. That's where it happened. You see, so you got to find a way to get the states to want to have to do their jobs again, which ironically, the plague sort of did a little. You saw a lot of states all of a sudden go, okay, we're going to do our own thing here. Um, that's how perverse this thing has been. But yeah, that to me is the biggest problem. It's not like everybody shows up in D.C. and says, I want to be corrupted. They end up getting corrupted, but they're getting corrupted because they get so much kick to them from various governors, Republican and Democrat. I'm glad you brought that up because I was I was buying a, a phone for my sons last night. Don't worry, everybody. They're just little hooligans. I bought them the crappiest phone you could possibly buy. In fact, I walked in and told the lady in the phone place, I want you to find the worst phone you have and then go to the back and find a phone worse than that. I got them this horrible little flip phone, so it doesn't matter. But I'm, st I'm staring at the floor and I'm looking at the things everybody's seen. The stand here and stand here and six feet apart. And it just, it hit me again how we have completely reordered American society over coronavirus. And I'm still, I feel like I'm still on a separate planet as everybody else. Don't you? Yeah, I just wrote a post last night about pandemic fatigue. And uh, I, I, I mentioned that, you know, I said I lived through the great Arizona hotspot summer of 2020. And I kept reading about what was going on in Arizona and then contrasted, comparing and contrasting that with what I was actually experiencing living here. And they weren't even remotely in the same vicinity. You know, if you read the newspapers, nobody was in their homes because the hospitals all just had people spilling out over into the parking lot, and that never happened here. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, it's just, it's like, I'm so out of sync with everything. And then we've been opened up for seven weeks here again, and we're not getting that deadly fall surge that everybody's talking. It's just not happening. But if you read the paper, the fall's going to kill you. We're on our third wave, and it's going to kill us all now. Well, look, I'm still dying from net neutrality. So I, I, I'll be lucky if I go from coronavirus. I, I got a bad case of the tax cuts. That, that's going to kill me. Steven Cruiser, everybody. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Jesse. Good seeing you. You too. All right. You've just got to wait and watch the salt and the spite. Hang on. I will admit, I am a selfish, horrible person. And as such, I've been to several birthday parties as a child and as an adult where I have been jealous of the birthday boy. So when I saw this little girl, you'll know the one I'm talking about right when the video starts. I didn't look at her and think, that's rude. I looked and thought, I hear you, girl. I hear you. <laughs> the best wasn't even blowing out the candles. It was how cocky she was after the fact. All right. I'll see you tomorrow.